in trying to dramatize the devastation that even casual racial that even casual racial contempt can cause. I chose a unique situation, not a representative one. And so she's also very clear that she doesn't try to represent the whole of uh, racial aesthetics uh, in the figure of Pekula Breedlove, who's just a young girl who goes through uh, a very horrific circumstance, but her only focus throughout the book is on having blue eyes and wanting to have blue eyes, um, so much to the extent that she uh, eventually believes herself to have them. Uh, and at the same time, Morrison, is pushing back around the aesthetics of novels in and of itself too, and also texts and stories and how they all form together. Uh, one of the main uh, ways she breaks up the book are using texts from popular Dick and Jane novels uh, before she just starts ram running all of the words together slowly until they become disjumbled. She's really into disorienting and disjointing. But however, one of the clearest ways to track a difference across this novel is through the myth of Persephone. And I'm not the first scholar, nor will I be the last to talk about uh, the bluest eye in Persephone. Um, if you want a very in-depth look at Morrison and her classicisms and her classical history, I would highly encourage everyone to look up uh, Tessa Royan's work on her. But Instead, I'm interested in the ways in which Morrison uses uh, the Persephone myth to talk about aesthetics and race specifically, because it is so different from so many of the other um, Black Persephone, as I would argue, that emerge out of the 20th century, most notably from Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God, uh, Brooks's In the Mecca, and uh, Walker's The Color Purple. Uh, Pecola is a very strange and very different and it's not even that she's like the only mostly tragic figure I would say uh, Brooks is equal with that in the Mecca, but there is a very particular attention around aesthetics that she plays with uh, in trying to talk about uh, this myth and especially themes of color themes of plants come up a lot. Um, and I have to confess, this is the where things get a little hairy for me because originally when I was coming up with this, this paper and wanting to present it to everyone, uh, I was just going to then from this point on, we're just like dive more deep, talk about different details and points um, around the bluest eye, how it's different from these other 20th century black Persephone's. And then while I was writing the abstract for this, um, completely out of nowhere, I just, I was at a bookstore and I just saw like a giant pomegranate on a book. And I was like, hmm, what is that? And then I realized with a sinking feeling that I recognized the font a little too well um, because it was Midnight Sun, uh, which is a novel by Stephanie Meyer. Oh God. Um, and I bought it because I was a very, very big Twilight fan uh, in middle school. And, you know, it was just sort of nostalgia. This is also a book that she has been writing since Twilight. Um, and she really like hyped it up in the aughts, in the late aughts. And I was very excited for it to come out. But then in 2008, uh, someone actually leaked the first 12 chapters of this uh, and she was demoralized from ever writing it again. Um, until apparently five years ago. Well, in 2015, she released another book um, that I actually don't have an image of because there's only so many Twilight books I can look up and piece together. Um, and it, I also don't technically count it as part of the series. It's called Life and Death. And it's basically Twilight, but just like, gender bent, I guess. Um, everyone just kind of like swaps genders and it's fascinating. It's about like, uh, I don't even remember their name. It's like Beaufort instead of Bella. It's weird. Um, but Midnight Sun, uh, I was I was very just curiously reading this um, as I was writing this abstract. And then a very sinking feeling uh, hit me as I was going through it because this is a novel that almost aggressively <laughs> tries to brand itself as a piece of uh, Hades and Persephone. Uh, reception. And I'll tell you what I mean by aggressively, by just reading a quote right here. <clears throat> she was frustrated by my refusal. She looked away from me, down at her food. Slowly, thinking hard, she took a bite and chewed with deliberation. 
Suddenly, as she ate, a strange comparison entered my head. For just a second, I saw Persephone, pomegranate in hand, dooming herself to the underworld. Is that who I was? Hades himself, coveting springtime, stealing it, condemning it to endless night? I tried unsuccessfully to shake the impression. So I would just like folks to know, um, especially if they're not familiar with Twilight or the books, this is a scene uh, where Edward and Bella are at a restaurant called Bella Italia, of all things, uh, and she is eating mushroom ravioli. <laughs> And so the leap from mushroom ravioli to pomegranate seeds is one that uh, never ceases to amaze and stun me. And that is the first, the first instance of uh, her referencing Persephone uh, in this book. But it goes on um, ad nauseum, kind of, like almost aggressively. I made a game out of it. I just started popping into my roommate's room and just like dramatically reading aloud the lines every time I found one. Um, because my roommate kind of was just like, not entirely believing me about how incessant it was. Um, here's two more examples. <clears throat> she walked almost reverently into the golden light. It gilded her hair and made her fair skin glow. Her fingers trailed over the taller flowers and I was reminded again of Persephone, springtime personified. Uh, and then it was easy to see uh, she was telling nothing but the truth. There were no shadows in her eyes. It brought her as much pleasure to be in my world as being in hers brought me. A flicker of unease twisted my expression. I thought of pomegranate seeds for the first time in a while. And it's pretty much like that for like the whole rest of the book. It's just like Edward, anguish, Edward, anguish, pomegranate seeds. Um, and so to get into this, uh, Midnight Sun, for those who are not familiar with it, is the book Twilight, just entirely from Edward, the vampire's perspective. Um, and it's it's a doozy um, and it's kind of delightful trash. Um, and there are some very sort of interesting, weird turns it takes. Um, but I think that, or at least when I was uh, writing this abstract, I was very, very shocked at all the ways that it started reflecting oddly, a lot of the things that I wanted to talk about in uh, Morrison's The Bluest Eye. More specifically, uh, there's this fascinating preoccupation um, that Meyer has already had with whiteness uh, in her writing. There are no black vampires. She kind of goes out of her way to say that there aren't any. Um, and even in the uh, casting of the film, she was very adamant about one of her uh, main white female characters that she could not be uh, cast as Asian, with, which the director was really wanting to do. Um, and also for like, uh, for those unaware, uh, the Quileute tribe, which is a real tribe um, on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington state where I grew up, uh, they're werewolves uh, in this entire series. And for like random chunks, like Edward just contemplates like killing all of them. So I was like, all right, we're just adding indigenous genocide on top of everything.